Hello, I'm Steve Goman, Director of the Center for Free Enterprise and the bb and Professor of Free Enterprise. Welcome to our final spring event at the Menard Family Lecture Series and our annual bb and Lecture. I want to thank the Menard family for its generous sponsorship of this series. I also want to thank Greater Louisville Aid, GLI, for helping us bring this program to the business community. Because we have five speakers for today's event, I'm, go I'm going to dispense with the preliminaries and get right to the introductions. Except if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section below. And if it's specific to a speaker, please indicate which speaker. We're kicking off Second Chance Month today with a panel discussion of Second Chance Hiring. As many as one in three Americans have a criminal record. This can create roadblocks to education, housing, and jobs, the very things that make their lives outside of prison productive and keep them from falling back into past behaviors. Today, we are talking about the importance of employing the formerly incarcerated. At a time when the baby boom generation is retiring and our labor force is, shri our labor force is shrinking, yet many companies exclude felons from the hiring process. Our panel will discuss the need to open up opportunities for all able individuals, all able individuals, and I hope the students and business leaders watching today will take this to heart. Eliminating these barriers to productivity and unlocking opportunities is a path to advancing the well being of society. Our first speaker is Jeff Karzenick, the chief investment strategist for Fifth Third Bank and author of the soon to be released book, Untapped Talent How Second Chance Hiring Works for Your Business and the Community. Jeff was recently elected to the Council of Criminal Justice for his work on the intersection of the justice system and the labor markets. He will be followed by Sidney Heller, Chief Program Officer for The Last Mile. The Last Mile is an organization that prepares incarcerated men, women, and youth for successful reentry with business and technology training. Sid first learned about in-prison programs after volunteering with the Prison Education Project in Los Angeles. Since joining The Last Mile, he's worked both in the classroom and in administrative and programming development roles. Next will be Alex Love, founder and CEO of Alex Love Consulting and partner at LevelSet. In her roles, Alex uses her deep background in human resources and talent strategy, as well as her expertise in diversity, equity, and inclusion to advise companies on best practices regarding policies, procedures, and culture to support the most inclusive workplaces. One of those companies is represented here. Robin Berry is VP of People for, VP of People for Rue Gilt Group. Robin is responsible for the company's fulfillment warehouse and studio in Shepherdsville, Kentucky, and the customer service center in Louisville. Rue Gilt Group has a robust second chance hiring program and has developed inclusive HR practices centered on a candidate's fit for the job and not past criminal history. Finally, we have Sumit Lal, who's a great example of what can happen when companies embrace second chance hiring. Sumit is a software engineer for Slack. He learned how to code at San Quentin State Prison when he joined the Last Mile program. He was released from prison in 2019. And besides working for Slack, he started his own photo rental, own photo booth rental company, and is also teaching Taekwondo to local youth. I'd like to welcome all of you today and thank you all for being here. We'll start the discussion with Jeff Karzenik. So Jeff, take it away. Thanks so much and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm gonna uh, make the economic argument why it is in all of our economic interests to see second chance hiring uh, go forward, to see people who have been incarcerated or even those who have not been incarcerated but are burdened by a criminal record, whether felony or misdemeanor, to see that they have better pathways to rebuilding their uh, lives critically through that foundational element of employment. Now it's an economic argument, so no economic argument is complete without some charts. So please bear with me while I share a couple of, uh, of uh, economic charts. I know not everyone is a graph person. Bear with me, I think we can get through these and uh, they, they illustrate some important facts. Uh, the first uh, a point is to ask where growth comes from in the economy. And we go ups and downs and cycles, but over the long term, there are two and only two factors that determine the economic growth potential of an economy. And that's how fast can you grow your labor force and how fast can you grow their productivity? 
And this concept is illustrated with the data you see in front of you. This is data we get from the Congressional Budget Office, and it shows historically what's been our growth in the economy and what could be attributed to labor force productivity growth, which is the blue shaded area, and what is just the size of the labor force uh, uh, growth. You know, how, how many people are you adding into the labor force and how productive are you making your total labor force? Green line is the people component of that. And as you can see, we've got a problem. And that problem is that we have had declining birth rates in the United States and the demographics are limiting our potential growth. Uh, you'll see that the far right uh, uh, graph here, the far right bar is the CBO's projection of our potential growth in the US economy. It's less than 2%. That's a pretty low growth rate. It's not the kind of rising tide that tends to lift uh, uh, other ships with it. And uh, it's really going to be a challenge uh, for, uh, for the years ahead. And the main problem is not productivity growth. Productivity growth kind of comes and goes. It's labor force growth. We've got the baby boomers exiting the workforce. We've got during the period of uh, COVID, we've had women leave the workforce, some men too, but primarily women leave the workforce to uh, watch over children who couldn't physically go to, to uh, school during the COVID period. We've had long-term unemployment. All this is weighing on our workforce growth on top of a demographic picture where birth rates peaked in 1990. It does not look well for the US economy. This means that the business community has to expect that they will have to dig deeper into the population to get the workers we need. There's a measure for this. Economists call it the labor force participation rate. What percentage of your adult population, technically your civilian, non-institutionalized adult population, what percentage of them are in the workforce, meaning either actively employed or actively looking for employment. And you can see a long-term history of this. This goes back to 1948. You can see that period of the 70s, in particular the 80s and 90s, we had rising labor force participation rates. That's one of the ways we were able to grow so quickly as an economy. But since 2000, it's been falling and COVID on the far right-hand side has created greater disruptions. Where can we get the workers we need to grow our economy faster and to prosper as a nation and as an economy? Well, we think one of the best opportunities is to look to those people who have been sidelined from the labor force or underemployed, not employed to their full productive potential because they have a criminal record. There are a couple measures of this. The one I focus in on, Steve had referenced that one in three, that's the 70 million number. The one that's the biggest impediment to advancing and rebuilding a life and, and having a successful uh, career and contributing to the economy is a felony conviction. 19 million Americans have a felony conviction. This is too big a pool for the business community to overlook. But the si size of the pool is not enough. It's also got to be the quality of that pool. Can people with criminal records be productive, good employees? And the answer is maybe not every single one, but there's no population where every single one, but there's a pathway to developing employees who are not just an employee of last resort, but are actually highly engaged, loyal employees, the kind of employees you can build your business on, people who care about what they do and stay in place. That's a recipe in the business community for both productivity and for profitability. And it turns out that there's a path to doing this. It's a model. It requires uh, business owners who are willing to consider this population, but also recognize that they need partners in this. Government agencies, government support, critically nonprofits, those are the partners you need to find out who's ready to turn their life around and rebuild it supplement those workers with the skills they may be missing, often from a lifetime without strong mentorship, and then critically provide ongoing support services. When you do that, you get a highly engaged, highly loyal workforce. You're gonna hear in the hour ahead from others who offer perspectives on this. And I think the message is the same. This is a viable workforce, not just to an adequate employee, but done right to a superior employee but that it requires an investment. And an investment in an uncertain economic period, sometimes a hard thing to make. So the last point I wanna make is, this is not an all or none proposition. 
There are steps that if you're an employer listening today, you don't have to embrace this from the get-go. You can test the waters. And it starts by recognizing that there are low-risk hires. People who've been out in the workforce who perhaps were never incarcerated despite having a felony conviction or who have been out for a long time and have rebuilt their lives. They're just another employee. Why would you discard their resume simply because of a mistake they've made in the past that they've already paid for? It's also important to understand the criminal justice system has in many cases over felonized and a felony may not be what you think it is. And it starts by giving fair consideration to applicants with a criminal record or educating yourself. There are many resources available on the criminal justice system. I always recommend the Twitter feed, Crime a Day, where a lawyer in Hartford, Connecticut, Mike Chase, goes into the federal code and pulls one absurdity after another out of the federal uh, criminal justice uh, code. Connect with companies, you have one on the call today, that are doing it. Look at their success. It gives you proof of concept and you'll, sh and you'll shortcut some of the learning curve on this. The same thing about nonprofit partners. There's a wealth of nonprofit partners in every marketplace. Not everyone is a fit for your business, but you can uh, almost be guaranteed that there will be at least one, two, or three partners who would fit and become your partners in developing this talent pipe pipeline. Even if you are not ready to hire from this pool of talent. Don't discriminate against vendors who are. You may not yet be ready to hire from this pool, but what do you care? Who does the maintenance work on your building, your facility, um, the electric work, the HVAC work? Um, all of these things are very important. Uh, if you have second chance uh, vendors, support them. Don't restrict their employees at your, at your work site or actively seek out uh, vendors who, who provide second chances because it's in all our interests. And then one final thing before I turn uh, the discussion over, you may have an employee on uh, your payroll today who's been with you for a decade or more, who's contributed to your success. I know some who live in fear every day that their past criminal record will come to date, uh, come, come to light and because of company rules, they would be automatically terminated. That's not fair. People who've been contributing to your success deserve amnesty. Consider implementing amnesty for any employee who's been with you in good standing for five years, one year, 10 years, uh, and make sure that these people understand that they are part of your team and embraced for who they are today, not for the mistakes they've made in the past. Um, with that, I'm delighted to pass the call over uh, to uh, Sid Heller. Sid, take it, out, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. I think I'm going to talk, do a little bit of a deeper dive into, into the last mile and what we do. I think we're a great example of how a nonprofit, the private sector, and the government can all come together in order to actually build some pathways for people who are currently incarcerated and how they can get jobs after they get out. So I'm just going to pull up my presentation here. So again, hi everyone. I'm Sid Heller and the Chief Program Officer at The Last Mile. The Last Mile is a nonprofit founded at San Quentin State Prison in 2010. Today, we offer an in-prison coding bootcamp, reentry wraparound services, and focus on community building, both inside and outside of the classroom. So who are we? TLM consists of just over 20 FTEs, including 11 who are alumni of our program. One of the things that we've learned in our 10 years of business is that you could take any software engineer off the street of Silicon Valley and ask them to teach coding in an environment without internet access, and they wouldn't have the first clue where to start. Our program's success is built on the foundation of staff who have lived experience and who have been through our program, ensuring that our methods and offering are relevant and effective for our student body. So what do we do? We have a one-year program separated into two courses for full-time students. We teach full-stack web development, including the industry standard technologies listed here, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, React on the front end, and Node, Express, and MongoDB on the back end. And our results, alumni of our program, one of whom is on the call today, work at these tech companies and more as software developers, engineers, project managers, and beyond. All of this is driven by our mission which is to provide opportunities for personal and professional growth for justice-involved individuals through education and technology training. 
Now through this mission, we have expanded from California to a total of six states, while always focusing on diversity and inclusion. Our 22 classrooms are roughly 50% male and female. We have had 300 people go through our program and be released, and we have over 600 students total served across all of the states we're in. So how do our students learn? Although our students code without open access to the internet, we have created a robust software suite in our classrooms to best replicate a developer's experience on the outside. All of the platforms you see listed here are hosted and managed by TLM and provided to the students via TLM hardware and the relationship and trust that we've built with the Department of Corrections that we work with. But in addition to software, we've created as a direct result of feedback we've received from students, remote instruction. Our instructors video call into classrooms on a regular cadence for QAs, lectures, and live assessments. Moreover, our instructors are former participants of our program. So they're able to provide contextually relevant and empathetic to the circumstances of our students guidance, not just cookie cutter solutions. This is one area that TLM is particularly proud of because two years ago, if you were to talk to someone in corrections about people who are currently on parole, live video calling into in-prison classrooms, some of which they may have been in just months before, the answer would have been a hard no. And yet today, in our classrooms, this is the status quo. Although remote instruction is typically once a week, the rest of the time, our students still have access to our help desk where they can ask curricular or project related questions and a TLM staff will answer them asynchronously. Our help desk is supported by our team of web development education apprentices or WDEAs. Our WDEA program is a six month apprenticeship for our program participants coming home where they have an opportunity to pay forward what they've learned in the classrooms to current students while also jumpstarting their careers with continued professional development and mentorship. Now expansion for TLM doesn't only mean new classrooms in new states. But in our journey to become the de facto in-prison education platform, we're also exploring new curriculum verticals, including a music and video production program and a networking program focused on preparing students for the CCNA certification. Now, we're an education program, which means we need to look at success and outcomes of our program. Typically, in the criminal justice space, success is measured by recidivism, meaning if someone who has gotten out of prison goes back to prison, they're deemed as unsuccessful. While someone who gets out of prison and does not go back to prison is said to be successful. Here at TLM, we don't believe that metric accurately measures success and in and of itself is not equitable because we can't use a broken criminal justice system to try and measure someone's success. We created the impact index to more accurately and with less prejudice measure people's success when they return home from prison. We do consider data points such as employment and salary, but we also look at things like housing, community support, education, and perhaps most importantly, how fulfilled and satisfied that person is with the life they are living. At our onset, we were an education program which offered technical skills, but at the time, we were not particularly well equipped to provide structured reentry support for our alumni coming home. We received many pieces of feedback from people going through our program and being released about the specific need for post-release services. In response, we created the TLM reentry department, which focuses exclusively on providing individualized wraparound support to our returned citizens. We understand that successful reentry is about more than finding a job. So our staff of returned citizen advocates, first and foremost, support our community members to make sure that they have their basic needs met and the resources they need to pursue a career that they actually desire. Housing, emergency support, continued education and professional development are all part of our reentry offering. And they're handled both in-house and with the help of our returned citizen community and business community partners. Now, coming full circle, speaking of business community partners, dozens of private companies contribute to our work in the form of fiscal sponsors, curriculum contributors, internal tooling donations, volunteer networks, one-on-one -on -one post release mentoring, and of course, pipelines to employment. This slide is a list of some, but certainly not all of the generosity in the business sector that has benefited us. Now, lastly, I have to do a plug because it's a presentation. So if anyone here is wondering, how can you contribute? You could hire a TLM grad. You could reach out to us about starting an apprenticeship program. 
or you could take a moment to evaluate your hiring process and ensure equitable and fair practice. The burden is on all of us on this call to change the societal stigma against justice impacted people. And lastly, of course, we're on a Zoom call, so please like and share us on social media and do not hesitate to reach out to info at thelastmile.org to learn about more ways that you can contribute. Thank you everyone. And I will pass to Alex Love. Thank you so much, Sid. All right, let me share my screen. Great. Um, thank you so much, Sid, uh, for that great overview of The Last Mile. Um, I am Alex Love, a partner at Level Set and founder and CEO of Alex Love Consulting. Uh, and I'm really excited uh, to talk to y'all today more about, you know, how uh, employers and nonprofits um, can intersect and really um, do more in the fair chance hiring space. Um, I focus on human resources and diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting. I led uh, human resources at Vice Media for a number of years, and during that time started an apprenticeship program uh, for folks that had been recently released. And it was really during that time um, that I learned how much fair chance hiring can really impact the culture of your organization um, and how it really can engage your employees. Um, so first, I would love to kind of ground us in some statistics as it relates to uh, employers uh, and fair chance hiring. So research has shown that um, folks with past convictions actually have lower turnover rates uh, and faster advancement rates. Uh, and similarly, there was a study that was done that shows that 82% of managers uh, who have hired folks with uh, justice involvement are actually just as strong or even stronger in some cases than their uh, peer employees. Um, and additionally, you know, uh, half of the people in the United States have um, a family member who has been incarcerated. And polling has shown that the vast majority of Americans are really familiar with this. Um, so it's not something that your employees or your staff are gonna be unfamiliar with. This is something that is really prevalent in a lot of folks' day to day um, and in our community. And thinking more about our community, you know, there are six and a half million people who are currently on probation or parole. Um, and there's tens of millions more that have past convictions. Um, and a job is one of the strongest predictors um, of successful reentry. But unfortunately, even with these numbers, um, folks with past convictions are still unemployed uh, at five times the national average. Um, and additionally, we find that children of uh, parents that have been incarcerated are six times more likely to be incarcerated themselves. And so here we really see, you know, the generational impact um, of uh, justice involvement. Um, and this really reminds me uh, of one of our clients that was kind of unsure uh, how their managers were going to take the news that they were going to start a new Fair Chance uh, hiring initiative. Uh, and not to our surprise, but to their surprise, the managers had such a warm welcome. They were enthusiastic. And beyond that, they were even, uh, some of them were quite emotional because they had known so many qualified candidates that wanted to work in, in their stores and couldn't because of the employer's hiring matrix. Um, and it's just one of those examples of how, you know, your managers and employees might be uh, more engaged uh, with this issue uh, than some of our leaders. Uh, but I'd love to talk to you more about uh, level set and uh, kind of how we collaborate and work with um, businesses in inclusive hiring. So we really start with thinking about policies and practices. You know, a lot of times um, being an HR person, like a lot of times we set policies and we leave them and it's been a while since we've really taken a look um, at what's that application process, what um, is involved in the background check process, when was the last time that we took a look at that, and secondly, um, have we really been thoughtful or intentional about how some of these practices might actually be barriers to qualified candidates uh, that would be, you know, a perfect fit for our organization? Um, so really thinking through those policies, 
Uh, but additionally, you know, thinking through all of the co collateral consequences that folks are facing as they're returning home. Um, so we make sure that we're talking to managers not only about how are they better supporting, you know, new hires and employees, um, but also to think through, you know, these barriers and uh, the things that folks are dealing with as they're coming home uh, and have a better understanding of how they can be supportive and navigate uh, those employees through their new, uh, their new workplace. Um, one of the other things that's you know crucial to think about um, when starting fair chance hiring initiatives is how are we going to communicate this back to staff right um, and as i just mentioned sometimes leaders aren't sure how that's going to be taken by the rest of staff um, i know that you know when i was at vice and we were about to launch the apprenticeship program um, I'm very used to, you know, sending HR emails and no one reads them, no one opens them, right? They're usually boring. Um, but when I was announcing the apprenticeship program, I had a wealth of responses from across uh, the organization, from leaders and from employees, just saying how proud they were um, and how this really just aligned with everything that, you know, our, our values were. Um, and folks were just so excited and wanted to know how they could get involved as well. And I think this is such a great point to remember is that, you know, a lot of employees are looking to organizations. Um, are they, you know, standing by their values um, as it relates to all types of organizational processes? Um, and, you know, thinking through um, hiring, um, are there uh, community partners that the organization might be able to partner with um, that have uh, access to folks that already have been justice involved and possibly already um, offer support and resources uh, and are eager to kind of partner with employers? Um, what our team does is really take a, a landscape approach and find the best kind of partners for uh, your organization and for uh, your culture and what those needs might be. Um, additionally, uh, we can think through creative ways of better supporting folks that are coming back to our community, you know, taking a look at your benefits and one, like, do your employees, are they even aware of the benefits and resources that they have? And specifically, how might you be able to better leverage those uh, benefits and resources uh, for, this, for this population? Um, and additionally, um, kind of circling back to what Jeff was talking about earlier, another thing that you can think about is where are the vendors that you're working with? What types of, you know, standards and policies do they have? Um, are they thinking about fair chance hiring? And are there opportunities for you to talk with other business leaders about fair chance hiring and how important it is um, and how it's really been a positive uh, impact on your or own organization? Um, the other thing that's really uh, exciting for us is a lot of time clients uh, will be in specific industries that are regulated, right, um, by whatever uh, they're doing, and we can come in and take a look at those. And similar to how our HR department sometimes has policies and procedures that are outdated and haven't, you know, taken a, taken a look at, um, we can also see that there are some of these policies that are in place that actually aren't beneficial to employers or to the candidate. Um, and are there opportunities for us to have conversations with policymakers um, about some of those pieces? Um, so I know that I just talked a lot at you and gave you a lot to think about um, as it relates to fair chance hiring, um, things that you can do in your organization. Um, and so what I'd really like to do now is to go over some of these buckets um, for you to think about more um, as you're considering how your organization can be a part of fair chance hiring. Um, so, you know, we really come in, take a look uh, at what those uh, current set of practices and policies are, um, really give recommendations as to those next steps, sitting down with leaders and really coaching and training them um, on uh, what the collateral consequences are and what it means um, to really implement this uh, new program and how that will have an impact on the culture and really tie back to the values that uh, you have as an employer. 
Um, and then the second part of that is thinking through um, our community partners, our recruitment and talent pipelines, uh, as well as how are we communicating that back to staff. Um, and then another thing that we wanna be intentional about when we're starting these programs uh, is how are we measuring that impact and that growth? Um, and how can we continue to take learnings um, and apply it back to our programs and just uh, continue to create more inclusive workplace cultures um, and be more thoughtful about how we are um, supporting employees. Um, and so one of the other ways that you might uh, dip your toe into figuring out where, where to start um, is SHRM's Getting Talent Back to Work. That's a really great place um, to find some resources. Um, and the, the link is there in the chat. Um, we advised um, on the uh, certification process that SHRM actually has as it relates to fair chance hiring. Uh, that's a series of videos, again, that helps one really get more aware of the space um, and how that looks really um, internally at your, um, at your organization. And with that, I want to say thank you so much. Um, I know there's uh, links and um, I think my email might also be in the chat, so feel free um, to reach out to us at Level Set um, to hear more about how we might be able to work with you and your organization, help you find community partners and really look at what your organization is doing. Um, and with that, I would love to turn it over to uh, Robin over at Rue Gill Group, um, who is one of our clients and can tell you more about how that went. Hi everyone, I wanna first say thank you for taking the time today so we can share our experience with Second Chance Hiring. Uh, Rue Gilt Group's interest in second chance hiring started with our senior leadership. In about 2018, uh, Rue Gilt's executive chairman, Michael Rubin, co-founded the Reform Alliance with Meat Mill, Jay-Z, and several other leaders. Reform was a charitable organization designed to affect policy change in the criminal justice system, specifically targeting probation and parole reforms. One thing that Michael learned and shared was through, found, through founding reform, it was so important to make sure that there was a job with a successful reentry from the justice system. We know through research that people coming back from the justice system who are able to reenter the workforce are far less likely to reoffend. We've had research through Northwestern University, Harvard, and UMass has shown that people with past convictions stay longer and advance faster from their peers. Rue's initial exploration, explorations into fair chance hiring were driven by ownership wanting to ensure that we were providing opportunities for people with past convictions to become part of our company, gain stability and success when they return to our communities. In 2019, as Alex said, we partnered with Level Set Team to support us in reviewing our policies and practices to broaden opportunities and help identify community partners who could refer candidates and provide support. We looked at our practices, we looked at our hiring practices and what we would allow. Uh, we used to do background checks and we used to not hire anyone with a felony. So we took those practices and we made sure that we changed them. And we centered on a candidate's fit for the job, not their past criminal history. Rue now has uh, great HR practices and they've been in place for a couple of years. We launched a transitional work program with a nonprofit reentry organization in Louisville called Center for Employment Opportunities, the CEO. With their partnership, it gave Rue a proactive way to make a commitment to second chance hiring. We actively seek candidates who may have been overlooked by other employers. At our partnership with the CEO, it's a transitional work model, meaning that the participant begins as an employee of the CEO, and we contract with them as a vendor to help staff our Shepherdsville warehouse. They're acting much like a temp agency. The CEO provides transportation from downtown Louisville into Shepherdsville. They provide site supervisors that come with the crews. They cover all HR issues, insurance, and administrative costs for their participants. We, the CEO participates also in weekly uh, job coaching with each of their people or each of the employees to help manage through the challenges of reentry and prepare them for a full-time workforce. 
For us, it's kind of like a trap before you buy an opportunity to consider candidates for full-time employment after they've demonstrated success and interest in the work that they're doing. Since October of 29, I'm proud to say that we've had 300 participants in the program. We have had 45 that we've offered jobs to. They worked here and most of them went on to other jobs closer to their homes, but this gave them their first opportunity. We still have five that are still active and working. Some of our learnings have been is the CEO participants have brought hours into the building that help with a lot of labor issues. We're in a tight labor market. The partnership that we have with the CEO has been really great. They source the workers, they train them to meet our expectations, and they keep a constant pipeline of people coming into RGG. The best challenge is having participants stay once they, can, they complete the program. So some barriers that we have ran into is transportation. We don't have a mass transportation system from Louisville to Shepherdsville, which causes problems when we make an offer to hire. Most of these people don't have transportation. So we try to work with the CEO program to allow them to stay in the vans until they're able to get the uh, secure transportation to and from work. We have found success with this work stream by treating them just like other associates. They go through our orientation and our onboarding program and they receive on the job training. It's valuable to an employer working with a community-based partner to help navigate the challenges the participants are facing as they return back to the community mainstream. We need resources that will provide labor with the growing needs for applicants in a tight labor market. And the second chance hiring program has done that for Rubio Group. Next up is Summit Law. Thank you, Robin. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm excited to have this conversation with you all because now more than ever, it is important for us to understand how the lack of equitable hiring is impacting our communities. You know, J Jeff said something. Uh, he pointed out that the fact that incarcerated people coming home um, returned citizens were marginalized or, or sidelined. And, and I kind of want to talk about how that one narrative we have of people uh, or that, that we associate with people that are coming home is so negative that we deny them the opportunity to redeem themselves, right? Um, and, and we hold this narrative so close to them and we associate it with them that we don't give these individuals a chance to provide for themselves, provide for them for their families, right? And I know this because I was part of those one in three people incarcerated in America or, or the 2.3 million Americans that are incarcerated, right? I went to prison when I was 19 years old and I came home at the age of 24. And what I want you all to kind of think about is your own narrative and how one bad decision that you've made in the past can be used to judge you for the rest of your life. This was the case for me when I came home. And prior to that, I did the work that it took to, to better myself, right? Uh, I participated in the last mile program. I taught myself how to code. I went to college while I was inside. Uh, you know, I, I got my degree. Um, but the minute I came home and, and employers found out about that, none, none of the hard work that I put into it mattered, right? So what I wanna talk about is, is changing that narrative. Um, it, but why does it even matter is because 95% of the 2.3 million people currently incarcerated will one day be released. And we have the opportunity to decide what kind of world we want them released to. Now, when I came home, I was fortunate enough to have a little bit of money due to my work with TLM's joint venture program. I was able to get hired with the last mile and I received a computer which I used to develop my coding skills. And I was later accepted into the next chapter program. Now, next chapter was established in partnership with Slack to create pathways for formerly incarcerated individuals like myself to obtain gainful employment in the tech sector. After completing next chapter, I was offered a return offer at Slack. Now, all of this was a blessing to me and the rest of the participants of this program. But there are so many countless individuals who do not get this opportunity. 
they're simply given $200 upon their release and little to no resources to navigate the re-entry journey. They too can be developers, instructors, counselors, or whatever they wanted to be with a little guidance and assistance from individuals like yourselves. You all can help make a change in the ways you factor in background checks. Companies deny qualified individuals based on who a person was five, 10, or 20 years ago. I ask you all to, look, to, to ask yourselves if the background check accurately reflects the person in front of you. We would also like to see support for the individuals that you hire who may be in transitional homes or parole, as Robin pointed out earlier. I'm, now, I'm not sure how much you all know about the parole system, but in many cases, being on parole means that we have to sacrifice our school, jobs, or family life to be in a mandated class that will likely not help us. Lastly, I would like to ask you all to be accepting of individuals coming into your companies with non-traditional backgrounds. I myself am a coding bootcamp grad, and I put in just as much effort in my role as the people who went to universities. Us returned citizens need you all to know that we are not our worst mistake. Upon my release, I applied to 83 tech companies. And out of those 83, I was fortunate enough to get seven phone screenings, three on sites, And with all three companies, I went to the last round of final interviews where I disclosed my background. And I was told that they cannot hire me because of it. Eventually, I'm sure I would have had to settle with a janitorial job or go back to my old ways. Uh, in order to support myself and my family, which would have just caused prison to be a revolving door for me. Sadly, this is true for many of the people who come home and don't get that one opportunity because of the stigma and the narrative that we hold that they went to prison, right? I'm not asking you all to do something egregious. Everything we want to do here is already being done by companies through, through next chapter like Slack, Checker, Zoom, and uh, CCI, right? The Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and many more companies, but those companies can only help a certain number of people. My request to you all is to take a chance on the next person that comes through your doors and has matter made a bad decision somewhere in their life. You'd be surprised how much one opportunity can change not only their lives, but yours as well. Thank you. thank all of you for um, this, this great presentation. It, it's really nice. So we've got some time for some Q&A and I'm gonna ask a couple of questions and we've got some in the Q&A section also. But I think Samit, you, you really kind of hit the nail on the head because I think many of us think that, that anybody has a felony is a hardened criminal. And you know, this is what we see on TV and, and we don't realize it's just, oftentimes it's, it's some young kid made a really dumb choice and then they get branded the rest of their lives. And, and, and so I, I don't know how we get that information out to people, but, but I think that that's a big issue, isn't it? And this is for anybody to address. I, I'll take that, uh, Steve, because uh, I, I spend a chapter in my book talking about this. And um, the, the majority of people who first interact with the criminal justice system uh, and end up incarcerated are young men. And uh, young men, uh, we know, have uh, later neurological development and uh, they make mistakes. And what's happened is that those mistakes become unforgiven, uh, as Sumit uh, mentioned in our society, and that's not right. Um, it's important also to distinguish that there are some myths out there. Uh, you know, I think there's a myth that uh, the prisons are filled with people with uh, nonviolent drug possession charges. That's, that's not true. Um, most people in prison are there for more serious offenses including a plurality, nearly nearly half, but a plurality there are, are there convicted for crimes of violence. But the point that I think is important to make is that uh, someone who in their youth was arrested for a crime of violence does not make them a violent person today. It's often a matter of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, inebriated, uh, under the influence of drugs, just clouding judgment further, and a very small mistake can get out of control. And it's, it's really important for employers to understand the circumstances in each case, to understand that people do age out of crime, and to understand the importance of working with organizations like The Last Mile or other nonprofits that can tell you who's ready to rebuild their lives. So um, what, what the second chance employers I've studied tell me is they might start with 
you know, I only want people with nonviolent convictions or, but, but as they come to understand, the more and more they understand, the more they experience, the more they realize that you have to take each individual as an individual and examine each record in that way. Anybody else want to add? I could maybe dovetail on that a little bit. I think, I think you're absolutely right, Steve. There's a problem with information and narratives that are being and labels that are being put on people who don't deserve them. And I think that a lot of times at, at events and listening to talks, I think some people in the audience feel as though, well, and I even, I think I saw a question earlier that people feel as though this is great. I understand. I'm ready to educate myself, but, but I'm not in a position to make a change. I'm not a hiring manager. I don't own a company. Maybe I'm not in a position to do something that, that drives forward fair chance hiring. And I think that considering that a large part of the problem is information that is, is prejudice and is bias and is just wrong, I think that everyone does have an opportunity to make a difference by educating themselves and then being able to have a more educated conversation should it come up you know, around the dinner table or at work or with your manager. So I think there's absolutely something that everybody could do and that's making yourself proximate to the conversation, keeping your mind open and, and educating yourself. So actually that leads into one of the first question we have here and it was that, um, what are, you know, how do we get companies to think about fair chance hiring, particularly like what can a student or an entry level person do for, in their company to get, make some changes? Anybody want to jump in? Yeah, I can. I can jump in there. Um, I think you know if if there's anyone who you know was in the audience today, for example, um, and is wondering kind of what to do next, I think the first thing you can do is start to ask some questions, right? Like what's going on with our current hiring process, go to your HR team, ask them questions. Um, what does this look like? Um, and you might be the first person that's asking questions around that. But it's important, like Sid said, like, let's start the conversation. Um, let's talk through those things. So there's been an issue about ban the box. And, and some people say, if we get rid of that, there might be more discrimination against certain groups. If we ban the box, and it's probably better, is it better if an employer says, look, we're willing to hire felons, let us know and we'll work with you instead of just banning the box and not want, and always wondering is somebody a felon or not? Is it better just to get the information out? Steve, if I can take that one, the, the uh, I can tell you what not to do with ban the box. If ban the box is imposed, the thing not to do is to say, gee, I still don't want people with a criminal record, so let me work around and assume anyone with long-term unemployment uh, has a criminal background or people from a neighborhood or a certain name. Uh, there is some evidence that that goes on and it is uh, frankly stupid. In a, in a uh, time when we are going to be talent challenged, you wanna be able to give yourself every opportunity to get star employees. I do think that that's a, um, it's okay for employers to ask the question if they want to. I think ideally you want to get to the point where you voluntarily as an employer don't have the box and even can go the extra mile and say on your job postings, we encourage people with criminal records to apply because that's how you're going to get access to the biggest talent pool. Uh, so uh, having a, if you, uh, having a box on the application sometimes discourages people from records applying. And if you are truly open to this talent pool, why would you want to discourage anyone? Uh, but, but I also, uh, am, uh, have seen the negatives of trying to impose this as a policy. It is not a silver bullet. There are no silver bullets. There are no short, shortcuts. And, um, I, I think it's better that employers be uh, broadly educated and come to this decision voluntarily. Yeah, thanks. And I'll just piggyback off of what Jeff said. I think uh, totally right in terms of there's not a, a silver bullet or a oh, one size fits all kind of answer as it relates to ban the box. But I do think um, thinking through all of the ways that the box is uh, impacting your, your talent pool, right? Because no matter what, if you have the box, you are limiting your talent pool. Right. 
Um, that's just uh, that's just part of it. And the other thing to consider is removing the box does not necessarily mean that you are removing background checks or that you are removing the question around convictions. It is simply that you are opening the door more to, hey, come apply, come learn about our opportunities. This might be part of the process and also really communicating what part of the process that is and what happens at your organization when someone does have a conviction. I think that's one of the things that we want to recommend to employers, like invite folks in and let them know that you are a fair chance hire. Um, so that they feel invited into the process instead of what Jeff mentioned, you know, they could be discouraged by this box because if you don't have enough communication around what that really means, the candidate has no idea. If I do check it, is it going to be good? If I don't check it, like, am I going to get a call back? I really just want to work at your organization. Yeah, and I can speak on our, uh, we did ban the box, so we don't have a box anymore once we started with the CEO program. And what we do when we hire direct hires is we do do a background check, but we have conversations. We don't automatically, if there's a felony on there, they say, no, they're no for rehire. We sit down with that applicant, we talk through it, and I would say 90% of the time they're a hire. Uh, so we, we decided to do that since we were supporting bringing in uh, second chance hiring that we would also do that for our direct hires. And it's turned out great. Um, I think some of our best people that we've brought in through the CEO program, they're so passionate. They want that job and they're thankful and they are, they are great workers. So I think the opportunity to just to bring them in is, is great, not only for the employee, but also for the company. So there's a question for um, Alex. What's been the response of employers when presented with the positive data that you showed us here? And do you still get a lot of pushback? Yeah, um, thank you first for that question, uh, audience. Um, and I think, you know, um, obviously we are always presenting this data, um, but what is always a challenge is what your preconceived notions were before we started the conversation, right? Um, because regardless of me giving all of this positive data, it is still something that is new. Um, and as we know, uh, being in business, being leaders, like trying something new, a lot of times you're gonna get pushback just because it's something new, not because um, that there's anything negative. Um, and so unfortunately it is still part of the process of, you know, I mentioned coaching and training and really working with leaders to think through um, how this is gonna impact their, their organization and culture. And part of that is just uh, folks asking questions of like something that might be making them anxious about this process and having really uh, honest conversations uh, about what the reality is. I could, if I could dovetail on that a little bit as well, I think one of the things that, that we noticed when speaking with, with second chance employers is it's difficult to try and answer someone's question that is coming from almost an emotional place with data. I think we've already talked about how, and Alex, I think you're absolutely right. The preconceived notions that people have from this kind of evasive portrayal of people that they're getting from the media, it, it, you're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole if you want to answer that question with then a set of data. I think data is, is really important to answer data-driven questions um, and to show statistics and, and, and probability. But I think without a conversation, if someone's coming, if someone's coming to the table and they're feeling a certain way, it will be very difficult only with data and data alone to then have them realize, oh, maybe the way I'm feeling is prejudicial. Maybe the way I'm feeling is bias. Um, so I think that the human element um, and, and having a larger conversation is the only way um, to supplement the data to actually change people's opinions. Are, are there certain occupations and jobs that fit really well for second chance hires? You know, I, I have not found something that a second chance hire couldn't do, right? This is a, a, a huge talent pool of people filled with possibility. But from the standpoint of paths of less resistance with employers, um, it obviously helps to have a tighter labor market because it opens them, it gives employers a willingness to at least give this a try. And um, what I found is say manufacturing is a very good place uh, because 
uh, there, there are labor shortages. Um, it's a livable wage in most manufacturing jobs. Um, it's often, you know, a lot of middle school jobs doesn't require uh, advanced education, but requires some very meaningful training that can be done by the employer or in public private partnerships. Um, you are not, uh, most of those jobs aren't customer facing, public facing. So again, in the mind of the employer, not in the reality, but in the mind of the employer, that's a greater level of comfort. You're not handling money again in the mind of the employer. Those are, those are issues that, that can come up. So uh, for, for people who are wondering if their company, you know, what the path of, of least resistance might be, manufacturers are one of the really good places to, uh, to start with this. Um, some, somebody asked a question, I, I can't find it right now, but um, how, do you, how might you deal with this in regulated industries such as insurance? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, uh, one of our clients was actually uh, American Family Insurance. Um, so we do have a little bit of experience uh, in insurance uh, as a regulated industry. And I think um, what's really interesting is even though this is a regulated industry, still taking the conviction to the job, right? Is the conviction at all related to what the job is? Um, because at the end of the day, regardless of what industry you are in, um, regardless of it's regulated, that's what's the most important piece, right? And sometimes, um, again, thinking about these preconceived notions, um, when we find ourselves in a regulated market, um, we might not investigate fully what those stipulations actually mean um, and kind of create barriers just on the assumption that it's very limited. Um, and so what I would really recommend is taking a deeper dive into how uh, the regulations are actually impacting specific jobs and um, specific titles instead of uh, considering it as, as blanket restrictions. Because um, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity there. So uh, there's one questioner, one person, and just got off of five years probation, and he's saying he's having a lot of difficulty finding a job. So what can he do? I think he does IT is what he said. Yeah, can't get a job in IT. You know, it's a it's a huge uh, hurdle. I, I always think it's effective to try to partner with nonprofits that already have pipelines to empl employers. So, um, you know, f find what are the reentry nonprofits uh, and uh, and uh, workforce development agencies that might have experience. Not because someone who's been out for five years doesn't know, you know, isn't capable uh, and, and might need any particular work or, or, or uh, managing of gaps, but because they'll have a pipeline into employers who are willing to consider this. I think it's important to have a uh, good response. Uh, if you do have, uh, if your uh, record is brought up, um, I, I've advised people, write it out, edit it, show it to someone, edit it again, uh, so that you have a really tight, you know, I own it, this is how, uh, you know, but that's my past, Here's how who I've grown to be today, and kind of keep it a clean response uh, is part of it. And then you know whenever you can pursue ways to kind of show to prove that you are more than this one past mistake, typically through education, things like that, I, I think can be uh, can, can be helpful. But it is an absolutely a um, an uphill climb, and I feel uh, I really feel for people who are facing that challenge. Yeah, I, I would I would second the idea. Of, there are there are organizations and nonprofits out there specifically geared towards helping people get jobs. And I think we're even starting to see it in some larger organizations such as LinkedIn, I know has a filter now when you're looking for jobs where you can filter only to look for companies that have self-identified as fair chance hires. Um, and I, I'm not sure where this person is geographically located, but of course, as a first place to start, um, feel free to reach out for us and we can see if we know anyone um, in our network that could help you as well. I, I should have also mentioned, um, look for ways that can ease employer concerns. So uh, most states have some kind of certificate of rehabilitation. You may have to work with a nonprofit to help you petition a court, look at opportunities for expungement or sealing of records. A lot of issues that employers have is, is just being very, very um, unsure and needing some kind of, uh, they are very often worried about negligent hiring liability. And even though negligent hiring liability 
uh, lawsuits are very, very rare. It is a fear for employers and they can be, if they do happen, they can be very distracting and costly to, to employers. So when you have a certificate of rehabilitation, you can show, uh, and each state has a different name for it, but, but if you search for that for, for your state, you'll probably find out what it is. That is a, uh, a, a safe harbor for the employer from these lawsuits. Um, if you uh, have your record expunged, it's obviously um, a non-event because an employer can't be held liable for something that they can't see. So these become really important additional tools that you can use, but, but um, uh, they're not possible in every case and for every type of conviction, but at least explore those. Samit, so, you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, keep developing your craft, make yourself uh, invaluable. Uh, eventually, you're going to get into that that interview room with somebody that will be willing to give you a chance. And, and if you could really go in there and, and um, just know your story and, and know, you know, what you've been through and just understand you're not that person anymore. Uh, if you could just deliver that to them, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure you'll get it. So just don't give up. Okay, so let's... Um... Let's just do one more question. I think one just came up. So let me let me look at it here. Actually, the, the guy who was asking about the job said, thanks a lot for the responses. So hopefully they'll get in touch with some of you. Um, so if if every, every participant today, we looks like we have 77, went to their employer and said, hey, what are we doing about second chancers? Would it have an impact or not? And what else should they push? You can't just say, what are we doing about second chancers? What should they say to their employers? You know, <clears throat> I think that um, you're right. Just asking the question isn't enough. Um, so I think, you know, starting the conversation, but also keeping folks accountable, right? Um, what are we doing with our hiring process? But, you know, continuing to ask, like, how does this align with our values? If our values are X, Y, and Z, and this is our hiring process, clearly that's not aligned. Um, and also pushing uh, the organization to consider um, having a larger social impact as well, um, considering this as part of the hiring process. I'm gonna give a really ugly statistic from the aftermath of our criminal justice system. One in three black men in America has a felony conviction. Um, and just to add to the whole ridiculous nature, fewer than half have actually spent had a had to serve a prison term. So their their uh, crimes were of such minor risk to public safety uh, that it didn't even require a prison term. So I don't know a corporation in America that hasn't bought into diversity. You tell me how you're going to possibly achieve your diversity goals and how our workforce can possibly reflect our population and the talents of our population if you do not cut a couple a diversity effort uh, with a second chance hiring process. So, uh, you know, I, I think I, uh, particularly if I were a younger employee, I'd find a more, a more uh, diplomatic way to get that fact across. But I think that's the fact that that also can be part of that conversation. So I said that was the last question, but actually somebody put something in the chat for Sumit, said, what has it been like working at Slack and what's your relationship with colleagues and does anybody care about your felony? Yeah, I mean, well, working at Slack has been great, right? Um, I, I love my team and, and uh, just how open and accepting they were me. Like, I feel like all the anxiety came from me, like, oh, what are these people gonna think of me, right? Like I have a record, I'm not gonna be able to compete. Um, all, all those were just like my negative talks. Um, everybody as I, has been more than willing to help me develop my skills um, and and, and uh, kind of hone in, in into what I'm doing. Um, so everybody's been really supportive and, uh, you know, I would like to see more of that uh, in, in more workforces. Okay, well, I think we probably ought to end it now. I think our time has expired. I know we had a couple more questions. I'm sorry I didn't ask all the questions for the audience, but I want to thank all of you for coming. This was really interesting and this is such an important issue and definitely for the labor force of the future, but even for right now, and we we are missing out on so many good opportunities, so many good employees. And I hope that um, the people watching today will take this to heart and maybe start hiring some second chancers. So thank all of you. Please, you guys, please stay on while we, um, while we shut down everything else. So thank you very much.